Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. We'll just give it a few seconds for everyone to connect. Welcome everyone, I'm Trisha O'Neill, the Director of Strategic Partnerships with the National Pancreas Foundation. And on behalf of the NPF, thank you for joining us for this webinar on EPI and chronic pancreatitis, which will cover definition, diagnosis, treatment, and monitoring. The National Pancreas Foundation's mission is to provide hope for those suffering from pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer through funding cutting edge research, advocating for new and better therapies, and providing support and education for patients caregivers, and healthcare professionals. Partnering with over 170 centers of excellence throughout the US, some of our featured programs include the Animated Pancreas Patient, the NF NPF Cookbook and Pocket Guide, our African American Initiative, our Patient Registry, and state chapters that support education, fundraising, and patient support. In addition, our physician programs include research grants, medical education, and our annual fellow symposium. We invite you to learn more by checking out our website at pancreasfoundation.org. During the presentation, please use the Q&A section of the portal to submit your questions, and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. On behalf of MPF, we'd like to thank today's presenters, Dr. Forsmark, Dr. Laura, and Dr. Barkin, and to Abby for sponsoring our educational webinar. Our moderator and first presenter today is Dr. Chris Forsmark, Dr. Forsmark is a professional, is a professor of medicine and the chief of the Division of Gastroenterology and Hepatology and Nutrition at the University of Florida. He received his medical degree from John Hopkins University of School of Medicine and completed his training at the University of California in San Francisco. He is past president of the American Pancreatic Association and is currently the board chair of the National Pancreas Foundation. Dr. Forsmark is and has been invited to speak and teach at scientific meetings throughout the world and has gained an international reputation as an expert in the field of pancreatology. We are in great hands today and I thank you all for joining us and welcome Dr. Forsmark. Thanks Trish and uh, thank you to my co-panelists, Luis Lara and Jody Bark. And we have a great uh, list of experts today to focus on sort of three different areas related to exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And again, put the questions in the Q&A box and uh, we'll address those all at the end rather than with each, um, with each speaker. And again, I wanted to thank uh, Abvi for sponsoring this. So I'm gonna start the presentation and um, my task is to talk a little bit about symptoms that are produced by EPI and how to make a diagnosis. And I put the picture of the German Shepherd here just to point out that it's not only humans that are uh, can suffer from exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, but it occurs in a variety of different animals, including actually German Shepherds as well. So the word we're using is exocrine pancreatic insufficiency or EPI, and um, it's sort of a challenge sometimes to define that. We sort of think about it, it's just some lack of digestive enzymes in the intestine, which is true, uh, but the insufficiency part means that the amount of digestive enzymes that are available is insufficient to uh, digest a meal, if you will. And the, even that can be a little tricky to think about because as humans, we have a lot of other ways we can digest and absorb nutrients, uh, protein, carbohydrates, and to some degree, even fat. And we're thankfully born with more pancreas than we actually need for normal digestion. So we can lose a fair bit of it and still have relatively normal digestion. And if we're thinking about digestion of a meal, it obviously might be important to say, well, what kind of meal are we talking about? Is it a high fat meal where we're really gonna stress the system? Or is it a small low fat meal where we might not stress the system? 
And for insufficient, you know, we kind of have to figure out what it is where what we mean when it's insufficient. Does it mean that if they eat a really high fat meal, they just have excess fat in the stool coming out that's not absorbed, that's diarrhea? Or do we think about more significant consequences like they're losing weight or losing muscle mass or becoming deficient in certain uh, certain vitamins? So even amongst experts, there's often a little bit of confusion when we use these words as to exactly what we're talking about. One of the interesting things, as I mentioned about the pancreas, is we have a quite a bit more than we actually need. And on the left is a little graph. And what the graph shows is that um, uh, you can see the curve and the, where the little dotted line that says upper limit of normal is how much fat normally comes out in your stool when you're eating a meal. And you can see as the lipase output drops as you're moving from right to left, it's not until you get to a very low number that the fecal fat starts to increase. And the, the conclusion of that is that we have a lot of um, uh, ability to digest fat, even if we don't have a significant proportion of our pancreas working. And it's been estimated that you can lose about 90% of your pancreatic enzyme secretion before you start being uh, become unable to absorb fat and fat-soluble vitamins. And when you reach that point where you can absorb fat and fat-soluble vitamins, you might not also be absorbing proteins or carbohydrates very well as much. Uh, but the um, the word that we use sort of to describe that is steatorrhea, which is that awful picture in the lower right, which is excess fat in the stool, which patients will see if they have a high-fat meal, if they don't have enough pancreatic digestive enzymes. I will make the point that uh, patients frequently are not willing to volunteer this to us. And as physicians, we often don't even ask them. So sometimes we're not sure if they're actually having this problem of steatorrhea or not. And one of the questions that comes up is why do we worry about fat so much? You know, part of the reason is that the digestive enzymes, which your pancreas makes, which are at the top there, amylase, proteases, and lipases, are eventually destroyed as they travel through your GI tract. And the one that's most easily destroyed is lipase. That's the one that digests and absorbs fat. So that's one of the reasons we're concerned about fat. The second is if you look at people who have kind of um, sort of slight insufficiency, if you will, that is they absorb most of the fat in their diet, but maybe not a normal amount. That's what CFA stands for, the coefficient of fat absorption. But even in those people that have relatively mild problems with fat, they can suffer significant nutritional consequences, like certain vitamins can drop as well. A uh, third point maybe is, is that as humans, it's a lot, we have a lot of different ways to absorb protein and carbohydrates uh, and fewer uh, ways to digest and absorb fat. And finally, when you do get deficiencies of these vitamins called fat soluble vitamins, there are consequences. And I just listed those here. You get, uh, you know, bone disease from vitamin D deficiency and night blindness from vitamin A and muscle weakness and neuropathy from vitamin E. So the reason we worry about fat is it's kind of the hardest thing to absorb. The enzymes that the pancreas makes are the most susceptible to be destroyed. And there are these kind of subtle but significant consequences of, of not absorbing fat and particularly the fat soluble vitamins. So who is it that gets this condition? Well, the one we talk about and the one we're focusing on, although not exclusively today, is chronic pancreatitis. And in patients with chronic pancreatitis, it's uh, there's probably around 250 or 300,000 people in the U.S. with that condition. Uh, about uh, you know 30 to 50 percent of them have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency in the General rule of thumb is the longer they have chronic pancreatitis, the higher the rate of exocrine insufficiency. That's that graph on the upper right, which just shows the approximate time it takes for patients to develop exocrine insufficiency. And you can see if you have chronic pancreatitis due to alcohol, that time uh, uh, is shorter than if you have other types of pancreatitis. ICP means idiopathic. So what caused your pancreatitis has an impact? The duration has an impact. And another interesting sort of sidelight is that if you smoke, that also has a significant impact in increasing the risk. There are other conditions where exocrine pancreatic insufficiency is common. So most kids with cystic fibrosis, for instance, 
Many of the patients that undergo pancreatic surgery get it. Uh, pancreatic cancer folks commonly get it. That's sort of the CT on the left there. And what it's showing is that uh, it's not showing the cancer, but it's showing a long sort of a, let me see if I can get my pointer to work here. Well, maybe not. Anyway, um, let me go back here. So that CT is basically showing that um, when you have pancreatic cancer, the pancreatic duct is often blocked. And so digestive enzymes can't even reach the intestine. And anything that really blocks the pancreatic duct uh, can cause this same kind of a problem. And then there are some other more rare conditions. And uh, one that's maybe not so rare is the CT on the lower right, which is a patient that's had severe pancreatitis and some of the pancreas has been destroyed. And so those patients can get exocrine insufficiency. So these are groups of patients that commonly develop exocrine insufficiency. The challenge sometimes is there's lots of other patients who can develop exocrine insufficiency, but might not do it as commonly. So the first is folks that have acute pancreatitis or relapsing acute pancreatitis, that's RAP, but who don't have such a severe disease that it causes necrosis. And that's that chart on the upper right there. It's looking at the prevalence of getting exocrine insufficiency in those with severe or necrotizing pancreatitis and those with mild pancreatitis. And you can see, obviously, it's more common in those with severe pancreatitis. But even in those with a more milder forms of pancreatitis, they can develop exocrine insufficiency and it can persist. So this is kind of a um, an area that's uh, really a hot topic for research is why is that? You know, if you if you really haven't destroyed so much of the gland that you would expect exocrine insufficiency, why are you getting it? We see it a lot in diabetics and the question comes up a lot in diabetics, particularly type one diabetics, certainly at the extremes of age, very, very young or uh, in the very old folks, uh, we uh, consider this sometimes. Uh, some of these patients will have sort of a failure of pancreatic secretion as they age. And there's a variety of other conditions where it's been studied in one way or another, and those are listed on this slide. Um, yeah, so there is a group of people who don't have some of the diseases I showed you in the last slide, and yet may be at risk for having exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And of course, if that's the case, it would be really nice if we had a a great way to uh, uh, to diagnose whether they do or do not have exocrine insufficiency. Unfortunately, we don't have such a uh, an easily available and accurate tool. When you think about the diagnosis of this condition, there are two general approaches that we take. On the left is you're just trying to measure the fact that nutrients are not being digested normally. Typically, you're measuring fat. Uh, sometimes protein. And the idea here is, is if you have insufficient digestive enzymes and you give fat or protein and it's not digested and absorbed, you can measure that. And we can measure that. One of the challenges is that digestion and absorption takes many hours. So oftentimes these tests have to last uh, multiple hours. But you can measure this process by sampling stool or blood or breath. The other strategy is on the right, which is just looking whether the enzyme level is decreased either in the blood or the stool or in pancreatic secretions. And in this kind of an approach, you could just measure the levels of these enzymes either at baseline or you could give some hormone to stimulate their secretion and see how well the pancreas can respond to that uh, stimulation. The first category is trying to just measure the fact that the enzymes are not sufficient. And the the way we used to do it is that awful picture on the top, which is a 72-hour fecal fat, where we would actually collect stool samples from patients over three days uh, while they were on a high-fat diet. And in that upper left, you see two silver buckets. The one on the right would be a normal 72-hour collection. The one on the left is a patient with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So it's liquid and it's white because there's a bunch of unabsorbed fat in it. You can also just stain the stool. That's the picture on the upper right, which is a stain for fat uh, called a Sudan stain, um, which only kind of gives you a snapshot of what's happening. As you might imagine, a 72-hour fecal fat is unpleasant for the doctor, the patient, and the lab. 
And so we rarely do it these days outside of clinical research. The other way is you can give the, uh, the patient something that they can ingest and that whatever it is has to be metabolized by pancreatic enzymes, in this case, lipase. And then you can measure the byproducts of that metabolism in the breath or in the blood. And the, uh, the two graphs in the middle part of the right are from breath tests where you can um, give the patient a fat that requires pancreatic lipase. You can give the fat that's labeled with radioactive carbon and that radioactive carbon, once it's digested, is incorporated into CO2. And you can measure that in the blood after many hours. Or you can just try to collect the pancreatic secretions themselves with a tube or, a, or an endoscope, which is the picture on the lower right, um, uh, which is a little more challenging to get those tubes down. Or you can do what we typically do is we just look for this those enzymes um, in the stool. And the one we look for is this thing called fecal elastase, which is a um, commercially available test. It's widely used. Um, I'll just make the point it's not actually elastase. It's a related um, uh, protein, but it's um, we just call it fecal elastase. And we use it because it survives intestinal transit. So what's secreted by the pancreas generally survives to be measurable in the stool. And there are some different cutoffs that are used for this as to what is abnormal. Um, some people use less than 200. Some people use less than 100. I will make the point it's less accurate in children. And although it's reasonably accurate, um, chronic pancreatitis is a low prevalence problem. So um, uh, even though it has relatively high sensitivity and specificity, and I've kind of listed those on the left of the slide, in a low prevalence population, you still have a high false positive rate. And that means that a lot of people in who you measure fecal elastase and have a low fecal elastase are gonna turn out not to have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So that's a lot of false positives, um, fewer false negatives. So it's a challenge I think sometimes in that a low elastase alone can mislead you sometimes. So it's not a test that I um, put too much um, stock in. It has to be this plus other clinical features or other suggestive features that lead me to uh, diagnose a patient with exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So when you're using elastase, just a few things to think about. Um, the stool sample that the patient collects and you send to the lab should be solid or semi-solid. And that's because if it's a real watery stool, it will dilute the elastase and falsely lower it. Second point is the patient can be on enzymes. They don't have to stop enzymes to do this test because the enzyme they're, they're taking are from uh, pigs and the test is measuring a human enzyme. Third is that the test can be quite variable. So I always measure it more than once. I have patients that have gone from 50 to 500, for instance, on different stool measurements. Finally, because of this false positive problem, I mentioned a low elastase alone doesn't prove that they have EPI. You need the right clinical setting, the right risk factors, uh, the right symptoms. And, uh, you know, there are lots of situations where this can be falsely low. The one I see most commonly is probably diabetes and age, uh, the uh, uh, advanced age might be another. But these are folks where you can have sort of a low elastase uh, without having exocrine uh, pancreatic insufficiency. I will also say that the commercial labs, you can also measure fecal chymotrypsin, which is another pancreatic enzyme, but it's less accurate than elastase. So I would uh, uh, you know, warn you to kind of not use that one. If you're going to do one of these tests, elastase is the, the one that's most, um, uh, most, uh, most accurate. So you'd think if we had a bunch of experts, we have three experts on the call today, and there are many more. Uh, do we all have consensus on what the cutoff should be? This is an interesting study that came from um, the Dutch pancreatitis study group. And they just queried a bunch of experts around the world and said, what cutoff do you use for um, thinking that a patient has exocrine pancreatic insufficiency? And you see that about 59% felt it should be less than 200, 18% didn't believe it unless it was less than 100. 4% didn't believe it unless it was 50. So that's kind of interesting. So we don't have consensus on that. They ask all these experts, does the level of the elastase influence how big a dose you'll write for your initial per prescription? And they said no. 
And then they had a bunch of case vignettes with people could weigh in on and give their opinion. And I'll just tell you that there was significant disagreement. So there is still a lot of confusion, even amongst experts, as to thinking about exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And part of the problem is we're sort of stuck with this diagnostic test of fecal elastase, which is unfortunately not as accurate as any of us would like it to be. So what is it that we actually need to make a diagnosis? Well, we need some kind of simpler test or some algorithm that can kind of give us a reasonable idea that the patient has what I'm calling clinically significant exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And by clinically significant, I mean significant enough that you should think about writing a prescription for enzyme replacement therapy. So we need something where you don't have to collect stool over 72 hours, obviously. We need something where you don't have to measure how much fat's coming in so you can compare how much fat's coming out. We'd like to do it without the need for anesthesia and an, and an endoscope. Uh, patients don't like stool collection, so we'd like to do something. Maybe you could collect with blood or breath. It should be easily repeatable. And hopefully you want to use widely available clinical and laboratory data. So anyway, this is what we really need. Uh, this is what we don't have. We have sort of um, taken a stab at it, and this is something that I did with uh, Luis, and I know Jody has seen this as well. And, and the idea here was that um, we know that fecal elastase is not great. And is there some other you know, approach we could develop to assist clinicians in making this decision? The decision being, uh, should I start pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy or not? So we came up with an idea uh, to try to come up with sort of a, a tool, if you will, a, um, a, a support tool for physicians to use. And what we did is we had a number of experts who had patients with chronic pancreatitis. So this is a, just for chronic pancreatitis, not for anything else. And some of these had exocrine pancreatic insufficiency and some, some did not. And it came from people that... Um, uh, were as you know, expert as we could find, really, uh, who could make this um, decision. We had some criteria for who did and did not have exocrine insufficiency, uh, which I list. But in any event, we um, analyzed this data, got lots of data from all of these folks, and analyzed it in a variety of different uh, uh, methods, a uh, variety of machine learning approaches, and eventually with this uh, CART approach. So CART is classification and regression tree. And it's a way to sort of classify, uh, you know, in this case, patients who with chronic pancreatitis who may or may not have exocrine insufficiency. And so it goes through a series of questions, the maximum number of questions you go through as you follow this is, is seven. And the way it's organized is by the machine learning analysis. It tells you which question you should ask first, which is the one that has the most discrimination, if you will. And so you can start at the top here and, and uh, you follow it down for an individual patient. And um, it includes a variety of clinical features. It includes laboratory features and it includes imaging features. Uh, and again, for most of these folks, these are uh, available uh, clinical data, they're available laboratory tests and they're available imaging studies that we commonly get in these folks. And as you follow this uh, CART tree, uh, it'll sort of bring you to um, endpoints where it'll sort of inform the clinician, yes, it's very likely your patient has exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, or no, it's not very likely your patient has exocrine insufficiency. And this is something uh, that was our hope, at least, could be useful for clinicians uh, to make sometimes a difficult decision, which is, do they really have it or do they not? You know, I um, and this is kind of a, a support, if you will, for for all of us, I think, to use. So anyway, it's available if you care to use it. Um, this is the website. It has this um, uh, this sort of decision tree you follow. It's quite simple. Uh, if you have imaging, which most of us will, uh, it includes imaging features. If you don't have imaging, you can still use it because the nodes where you go yes or no, it's sort of yes, no, or, or don't know, or don't have that data. Uh, 
And it brings you down to these endpoints, which kind of gives you some useful information, I think, about what the likelihood is that this particular patient with these particular clinical features has exocrine insufficiency. And uh, so if you go there, there's a little video you can watch if you want to. And uh, you get kind of our little written response that kind of summarizes it and gives you some additional information. So we're still looking, I think, for the, um, you know, the best option uh, to make a diagnosis in these folks. And this is, um, uh, this is not perfect, but it, the hope is it'll provide a little bit of additional and useful information to, um, to clinicians as they go through sort of making a diagnosis about, um, you know, is the patient have the right symptoms? Is it the right clinical setting? And should I initiate uh, therapy at this point? Well, that's what I wanted to talk about, which is sort of the symptoms and the challenges of diagnosis. I'm going to turn the second um, uh, section over uh, to Dr. Luis Lara, who is a, a professor of medicine, and he's the director of digestive diseases at the University of Cincinnati. And I've known him for uh, many years in his um, uh, former uh, training and faculty positions with Mayo Clinic and Southwestern, Baylor, the Cleveland Clinic, um, and Ohio State, where he was quite successful. And now he's um, taken on the job as leader of the division at the University of Cincinnati. He's a, a well-known and respected expert in the field of pancreatic disease, especially acute and chronic pancreatitis, and also has a particular expertise in the area of islet cell autotransplant. So, Luis, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Forsmark. Always so difficult to follow you, but that was really fantastic. And thanks, everybody, for um, uh, attending. And, uh, of course, thanks for the invitation. So I'm going to talk about enzyme preparations and how to dose in um, them and pitfalls of not responding. So this is my conflict of interest. And these are going to be my objectives. A very brief review of pancreas physiology just to kind of make sense of how enzymes work. I actually want to bring you through a little bit of the history of pancreatic enzymes, as it turns out, in the United States. They had to go through a new drug application, so we're going to talk about the ones that are available for us in the United States with dosing and dose adjustment, response to therapy, and you know some some uh, some conclusions. So this is your pan uh, pancreas, right? A cartoon of a pancreas on your left. Um, the pancreas, a small organ that is in a very congested area, a bunch of blood vessels and intestines. As you can see, 80% uh, of the gland is really the astroner or the um, exocrine function, the one that produces enzymes. Uh, and just the 5% of the gland really are the islets that produce all the hormones that are necessary to uh, control our blood sugar, lipids, and so forth. So a lot of the pancreas is really made just to produce pancreas juice and pancreatic enzymes. And to the right, you see an astroner cell, and you can see how complex the mechanism for um, uh, 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 secretion is. It has to go through different pathways, but basically digestive enzymes are produced in the preform, so they don't out of the, just the pancreas for the most part. And as they travel through, they get mixed in with some uh, water and bicarbonate to buffer the acidic content coming from the stomach. So, uh, and then in the intestine is where the pancreatic enzymes become activated um, through um, a, an enzyme called enterokinase that, cl uh, that uh, cleaves trypsinogen to trypsin that then pretty much activates all the other enzymes. So they're safely activated in the small intestine um, and uh, as we'll talk about the medication that's available, that's, that's, it, it's already, you know, administered in an active form. Amylase and lipase, you're probably quite aware of that. That's widely available as a, as a test. And we're going to talk a little bit more about lipase uh, as Dr. Forsmack has already uh, initiated that discussion. So CCK is a major stimulus, um, post-time is a major stimulus for pancreatic, pancreatic secretion. I'm not going to go through this whole cartoon, but it just shows how CCK follows one of the path or, or activates one of the pathways to initiate, especially astronaut cell secretion. Uh, and interestingly, enzymes, whether endogenous or exogenous, you know, administered through an enzyme supplement, they actually inhibit CCK. And this is a normal regulatory mechanism to tell the pancreas to kind of shut down. Obviously, it's a little bit more complex than this, but just, just to indicate this and maybe why taking enzymes may help decrease pancreatic output and in some cases, potentially improve abdominal pain in certain cases. So um, uh, Dr. Forsmark already went through this, but I want to highlight again the fact that you have to lose a lot of your pancreas mass 
and pancreas function before you start developing fat in the stool. Actually, I used data from the same institution and looked at over 500 patients. You see our graph is very similar to what, the, to what Dr. DeMagno had produced quite a few years ago. And it just shows us again that fact that um, you need to lose out of your pancreas uh, mass to actually develop insufficiency. But the other important thing here is there's subclinical EPI or extracurricular pancreatic insufficiency or dysfunction may exist uh, actually and may only become evident after, for example, a large food bolus. So even though this is true in the clinical setting uh, and definitely in the research setting, clinically, um, you have to keep in mind that some patients with mild disease may actually exhibit the symptoms of um, pancreatic insufficiency when given a larger food load. Now, pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy, we call that PERT, they're not new. Interestingly, they've been used since the early 1900s. Actually, Creon, initially with a K, uh, is the oldest brand. It's been available since 1908, believe it or not. It's been used in adjunct therapy for cystic fibrosis since the 1930s. However, the FDA raised a few concerns back in the late 1990s and early 2000s about the composition, uh, enzyme activity, bioavailability, quality, performance of the medication, and also the, the, the formulations were all over the place because they used US units, uh, European units, and other units, made it impossible to actually even compare, you know, what are we talking about dose-wise? It was difficult to inter interpret the efficacy, safety, optimal dosing, uh, drug delivery, and so forth. And so the FDA mandated a new drug application for all pancreatic enzyme uh, therapy. Those that are on the call who remember some of the names of the older ones, that's why they cease to exist. This was an expensive process, and not, not all the companies went through this. So these are the uh, PERT that are approved in the United States. You can see uh, their year of approval. This is just uh, on, on the left. It's just an alphabet alphabetical order, and, and, and starting above uh, Creon and then down below Zempec, both approved in 2009, and the, the uh, manufacturers are right there. And um, on the uh, table on the right, you'll see the brand name again, whether they are enteric coated, Enzymes, as Dr. Forsberg already mentioned, are very labile, very weak. They become destroyed very easily as they travel through the intestine. Actually, for example, lipase gets destroyed in, in the very proximal small intestines as it travels through. Uh, and some of the other enzymes yeah, generally get destroyed uh, um, as they travel through the, through the bowel. Some of them make them all the way through, of course. But anyhow, so that's why they're enteric coated. And they're all types of forms, spheres, microspheres, microtablets, mini tablets. Actually, Biocase, for example, in this table is a tablet and it's not enteric coated. Um, and um, uh, these are the different doses that are available commercially. As you can see right here, there's a variety of that and there's a reason for that. We're gonna talk about that in just a little bit more. Um, the other thing are the studies that were based. These are the, uh, the, that, that were done to actually receive FDA approval. And if you see right here on this, uh, uh, on this part right here on the studies, you'll see that only two, Creon and Biocase, had patients who had chronic pancreatitis or had unequivocal extracurricular pancreatic insufficiency because they had total pancreatectomy. The whole pancreas was removed with eyelid auto transplantation. So the vast majority of the studies were done in patients with cystic fibrosis, who also most of them developed extracurricular pancreatic insufficiency, but maybe the mechanisms are a little different than chronic pancreatitis. The other thing I wanna highlight is the cost. This is for 30 pills. Anybody who's on enzymes know how much this lasts, right? And look at the cost. It's not, not, not small and something to consider when prescribing these medications. So I want to summarize the studies and didn't, definitely didn't go over each one because that would take forever. But most of the studies were performing in patients with cystic fibrosis, right? Uh, I'm sorry. Um, and so many pediatric, many were pediatric patients or were young adults. So I want you to keep that in mind as we interpret the, the test results and how effective they are. There were two studies uh, involving the brand names Creon and Viacase that included patients with chronic pancreatitis or had total pancreatectomy and idolatal transplants. And the studies were done with various crossover designs. For example, you were blinded uh, and given a placebo, then the drug or a drug and then cross over to a placebo. So it was never two groups necessarily, but the same group that just crossed over. Uh, so, and very few were actually randomized controlled trials because they're at that gold standard where people are blinded, you know, if you're taking the drug and, uh, and then you follow patients over time. So actually very few of these were randomized controlled trials. And it should be noted that none of these trials had more than 50 something patients. 
So the numbers were very small. However, according to statistical, statistical analysis, they were done, you know, keeping in mind um, the, the uh, appropriate outcomes. So um, now all of the enzymes are based on USP, United States Pharmacopeia lipase units, unlike previously. Important thing to mention is they are all pig derived. And for some patients, because of religious reliefs, you have to keep that in mind. And I've had usually, when I have that discussion, thankfully, usually even with a religious leader, they're approved because there's no other, there's no other alternative. But just keep that in mind. And ultimately, guess what? The dosing, and keep in mind, most of these studies were done in cystic fibrosis patients. The dosing is based on the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Consensus Conferences Guidelines. And these are the doses, right? As you can see, they're all based weight-based. There's a maximum you should give, no more than 10,000 light-based units per kilogram per day. Keeping in mind, the paper produces much more than that, as Dr. Forsbach already mentioned. And when you use extremely high doses, we would not use now over 5,000 light-based units per kilogram weight per meal was associated with a condition called fibrosis colonopathy, scarring of the colon in patients who were young and who had cystic fibrosis. I don't think we've seen this in a very long time, especially with appropriate weight-based weight, weight -based dosing. By the way, weight-based dosing is extremely important in patients with cystic fibrosis as their children who are growing thus need the most appropriate doses of enzymes. And dosing um, is also based uh, for adults in clinical studies that showed improvement in the amount of fat in the stool, a complicated, actually a very simple formula, but it's complicated to obtain all this stool, Dr. Forsmack mentioned. You have to obtain a lot of it over three days with obtain, uh, while consuming 100 grams of fat a day, which is about the equivalent of three fast food burgers. And if somebody has insufficiency, that's a lot of fat and a lot of diarrhea to, and, and, and discomfort. And this is how you calculate the coefficient of fat absorption. So in adults, however, PERT dosing is rarely weight-based. And as it turns out, it is manufacturer dependent uh, because uh, you know, they, that's how they found the minimal effective dose that was, uh, that was effective based on the outcomes of the studies. For example, for Creon, the most effective dose was found to be 72,000 lipase units with a meal and 36,000 with a snack. That's your starting dose for an average 160 pound plus uh, adult and that's how you should start this. Other makers like Zempet, for example, found that dose to be 40,000, twice, uh, uh, two with meals, one with snacks, and, uh, and that was their, their appropriate dose. But keep in mind, none of the studies were done to actually establish the dosing that was actually studied subsequently based on the clinical response. Now, thankfully, if not all, many of the vendor sites have dosing calculators if you need them. And again, if you're taking care of children, Definitely uh, uh, children with cystic fibrosis, you, you may want to do that to make sure you're giving the appropriate dose, uh, but they're available. And the other important aspect here about dosing is they're not interchangeable. So for whatever reason, you're switching from one brand to the other, you should start at that minimal effective dose and then work yourself upward rather than trying to figure out if you're taking this much of this, maybe you need this much of the other one. They're not necessarily dose equivalent. So do they actually help? And this is a summary of studies. Uh, and again, not going into each one particularly because it would be very boring, but uh, the coefficient of fat absorption. This is, um, um, oh, I already mentioned that. You can actually measure that. And uh, yeah, it improved when the, you took pancreatic enzymes uh, while taking 100 grams of fat a day. If you consume less fat than that, will the coefficient of fat absorption be as impressive? Not clear. The fre frequency of fat excretion, how much fat you're losing in the stool, the actual weight of the stool and the stool consistency improved from being very liquid, as we saw that impressive picture a little while ago, to actually being a more formed stool. However, depending on the study, there was variable results regarding the coefficient of nitrogen absorption. Keep in mind, pancreatic enzymes include enough digestive enzymes of lipase. And I should have mentioned that a little while ago. The reason why lipase is used is because this is the one that we cannot make up in the rest of the GI tract. We have enough enzymes to break down protein and sugars. The pancreas produces 90% of the lipase that we produce as humans. And when the pancreas can't produce that, there's no way to make it up. And that's why the enzyme supplements are based on lipase units. So nitrogen absorption improved in some studies, not in all. 
And not all studies showed necessarily improvement in nutritional parameters or outcomes like osteoporosis and osteopenia or even weight gain. So how do we evaluate the response to enzymes? Well, I think um, the appropriate thing to do is dose appropriately, number one, make certain that patients are taking the enzymes appropriately also. As I uh, already mentioned, enzymes are very weak. So if you take them and, you're not, and you don't eat, they're, they're gonna become destroyed, especially in that very acid environment of the stomach. Uh, so they have to be taken with the meal, not before, not after, ideally with the meal. And um, the other thing is appropriate dosing and, and, and you should follow up patients in a few weeks, I usually do this every two weeks with a phone call to dose it just as necessary. So what happens if they tell it's not working? My stools are still loose, I still have gas and, and, and so forth. We'll review the cause and confirm the presence of pancreatic insufficiency. Is it a diagnosis they've dragged on because somebody just did a fecal elastase and established they have this, or do they truly have this? I can't tell you how many times I repeat the, the fecal elastase and it's totally normal. So, uh, and the other thing is patients who have mild extracurricular dysfunction after an acute pancreatitis attack, when they have mild chronic pancreatitis, uh, maybe it's because of altered gastrointestinal anatomy, they may not experience any benefit at all. So you have to think about, well, it, I'm dosing appropriately, but for the condition, it's just not working. Let's think about something else. Again, taking the appropriate dose and at the right time with meals. Keep in mind, and I've noticed this very frequently, especially in the electronic medical record, that uh, the automatic dosing of enzymes when you pick them as, as when you input them into the medication list tends to be incorrect and usually, usually utilizes very inappropriate dosing, right? And now is the medication not being delivered? Is there something altering how the enzymes are getting to that food bolus? Do they have slow GI transit? Do they have altered gastrointestinal anatomy from surgery? And is there something else like bacterial overgrowth? Now, sometimes you have to add something else to potentiate the enzymes or improve their survivability, like adding acid suppression, especially for the ones that are not enteric coated. Uh, and keeping in mind, of course, as I already mentioned, that pancreatic enzymes are very sensitive to destruction and especially to acid. So when you're using the non enteric coated ones, a PPI may be helpful, or when the enzymes don't seem to be working, maybe something you may consider adding. And uh, I would certainly encourage you to avoid a trial of enzymes to establish the diagnosis of extracrine dysfunction. I think we see this frequently in the clinic and it's a backward workup to actually establish whether that patient even has a pancreas problem or pancreatic insufficiency. Now the therapy will require much more than enzyme replacement therapy. Um, and uh, as already mentioned, you know, nutritional issues are quite common. So you have to have regular nutritional assessment. Thankfully we have access to a dietitian and intervention is usually necessary because you'll have malnutrition and, and organ damage as already mentioned, um, and uh, fat soluble vitamin deficiency and other deficiencies of micronutrients usually not evaluated like magnesium, zinc, um, uh, thiamine, folic acid, and of course diabetes uh, mellitus management is highly important uh, as it also affects how uh, food is digested uh, and, and absorbed and how it travels through the gastrointestinal tract. So there are many questions about enzymes, right? The data on enzymes uh, for chronic pancreatitis is limited and the uh, dosing is based on small studies, few randomized control trials, small number of patients, definitely uh, short follow-up. And uh, even the patient population studied may not represent the whole patient population, for example, in the United States. Uh, the appropriate dose remains a clinical challenge and it's uh, really based on, res on clinical response. And we definitely need better surrogates of response, such as weight regain, nutritional parameters, and improved quality of life. I will tell you that we do have an abstract likely coming up at the next uh, national meeting that suggests that there is an improvement in quality of life in patients appropriately dosed with enzymes. And we don't really know which enzyme replacement therapy is better. We don't, they're not interchangeable, and I don't think we'll ever have that data appropriately. So in conclusions, um, PERTs definitely improve fat absorption in patients that have extracurricular pancreatic dysfunction and sufficiency. In many cases, diarrhea and satyria will also improve. Re re recall that we're giving lipase, we're administering the enzyme that the pancreas, generally only the pancreas produces, which is lipase. You have to monitor weight and stool frequency and dose adjust. Review the medication list and make sure the patients are taking the enzymes appropriately. They're not interchangeable, so start new ones at the recommended dose. They're usually generally equally effective. 
uh, whether the non-enteric coated is better than the others, really that remains to be seen and they're not inexpensive. So make certain that patients need them. And with that, I thank you very much and I'll turn it over to Dr. Barkin. Thank you. Thanks, Luis. And again, I want to remind the audience to uh, put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll uh, address those at the end of the um, end of the sessions. All right, so our third speaker is Jody Barkin. Uh, Jody is a uh, dyed-in-the-wool Miami person who's uh, trained there in undergrad, had residency, fellowship, and now is on the faculty at the University of Miami. Uh, he's uh, uh, the director of their um, uh, uh, pancreatic and small bowel disease uh, group. Uh, he runs the National Pancreas Foundation Center of Excellence in Pancreatic Disease. He's a, a associate editor for one of our major journals focused on pancreas, uh, published and also has sort of an interest in small bowel disease, which is an interesting side life. But I've known Jody for goodness, almost his entire life, I would guess. And so uh, he's uh, we're delighted to have him tell us a little bit about some of the complications we need to think about in these patients as well. Thanks, Jody. Thanks, Chris, for the introduction. And thank you to the NPF for the opportunity. Um, between uh, Chris and Luis's presentations, they're the perfect setup uh, for here with hopefully not too much overlap. And we'll talk about what happens when um, we actually don't treat or don't effectively treat exocrine insufficiency. And then I would be remiss if we didn't talk a little bit about diabetes as the concomitant nature of both of these conditions um, in, for example, patients with chronic pancreatitis is rather high um, and important to understand the interplay of both exocrine and endocrine pancreatic dysfunction. Disclosures. Okay, so two easy things today. We'll talk about what happens when we don't treat exocrine insufficiency, and then we'll also describe uh, endocrine pancreatic insufficiency or diabetes specifically in relation to pancreatic disease. So we've talked a little bit about the symptoms so far and things like diarrhea or steatorrhea or bloating or abdominal pain. But when you have those, it may also lead you to not eating or not wanting to eat in terms of cytophobia. And that is really where we start to see not only the impact of not digesting your food because the pancreas is not working, but then you may see people that start to avoid eating. And that leads us to not only digestive consequences such as malnutrition, you may get weight loss from that, fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies, which are going to be the focus of a series of the rest of our talk here, and then micronutrient deficiencies, as Luis pointed out, based on the treatment in the last talk. Now, the ACG guidelines from 2020 were very helpful in terms of understanding a variety of things on chronic pancreatitis, um, but limited in terms of the mention of exocrine insufficiency. And I think the two key parts here are periodic evaluations for malnutrition, looking at consequences of fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies and osteoporosis, and then a little bit about dosing um, and utility in pain is also mentioned as Dr. Forsmark is one of the authors uh, on this, but it's an important concept for us to understand that these are really consequences of a disease, not specifically chronic pancreatitis, but rather the comorbidity it causes in exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So overview in terms of a few things in general, we know that there's fat-soluble vitamin deficiencies, A, D, E, and K, sometimes B12 as well. Now, when we think about vitamin A and E, we think about night vision changes, um, we think about skin issues, vitamin D usually leads to bone disease. You can see to some extent coagulopathy severe, or severe vitamin K deficiencies, but then there's other things like weight loss that we've talked about for a variety of reasons, and then malnutrition secondary to both maldigestion and oftentimes avoidance. Louise pointed out the important part about quality of life, and we know that in patients um, from a variety of studies now in a variety of different ways, the quality of life with any chronic disease um, generally decreases, and chronic pancreatitis and exocrine insufficiency um, are no, um, no exception to this. And unfortunately, it's something that's really important as this oftentimes may not only impact the patient's quality of life, disease experience, and treatment experience, but it really does impact a series of other conditions. For example, we recently presented data on increased risk of anxiety and depression, 
and overall decreased health-related quality of life in patients with chronic pancreatitis and exocrine insufficiency that improves with treatment. The study here on the right shows a Kaplan-Meier curve, and this is based on severity of fecal elastase in patients with advanced pancreatic cancer. And while it's by no means an endorsement or a treatment for this, I think it does um, start to underscore the interplay of nutritional status on survival in other pancreatic diseases, such as pancreatic cancer, with some survival benefits in patients that have a little bit better nutritional status and less weight loss. And so bear with me and forgive me for extrapolating the data a little bit more, but I think it's important to understand um, that there's not only impacts in terms of chronic pancreatitis, but other pancreatic disease as well. This is a study out of the famous uh, pancreas group in Santiago de Compostela in Spain. They followed their cohort of over 400 patients with chronic pancreatitis. And they looked specifically first at cardiovascular disease. And the risk when you had exocrine insufficiency in chronic pancreatitis of having a cardiovascular event had about a five-fold increased risk. If we think about traditional risk factors, let's say like diabetes, if you added diabetes onto um, exocrine insufficiency, your risk of your odds ratio here went up to about six and a half. And to give you a comparison, we usually would tell patients, for example, that have heart disease, hey, listen, um, let's get your blood pressure under better control or stop smoking. And those only have about a threefold increased risk. So exocrine insufficiency alone markedly increased risk compared to, for example, traditional risk factors such as hypertension or smoking. In that same group, they looked at the overall risk of mortality in patients with chronic pancreatitis, and exocrine insufficiency was associated with over a twofold increased risk of mortality. And there were several other factors, for example, age of diagnosis, a toxic etiology, for example, um, and worse nutritional markers um, in those that had worsened mortality. So we start to see the interplay of perhaps etiology of exocrine insufficiency and overall nutritional status impacting survival. There are several anthropomorphic effects, meaning body effects, um, when we have exocrine insufficiency and chronic pancreatitis. First, a bit on weight. So weight is often underweight in patients with exocrine insufficiency and vice versa. Exocrine insufficiency in and of itself is associated with lower weight. Um, and that's part because patients may have maldigestion um, of their nutrients, but it may also be because they avoid uh, food secondaries and not wanting to provoke symptoms. When we look at muscle mass and that's called sarcopenia, um, we know that there's actually an increased risk of having low muscle mass um, in patients with exocrine insufficiency and vice versa. Bone disease is a really important um, risk and consequence of patients with chronic pancreatitis and exocrine insufficiency. And we know that bone density decreases are common across the population but they're more common in patients with chronic pancreatitis and exocrine insufficiency. And so the risks, for example, in patients with chronic pancreatitis alone, osteopenia, so decreased bone density risk of about 40% and full-on osteoporosis in almost a quarter of patients. And that's compared to, for example, matched controls, you have about a three and a half increased uh, percentage um, comparatively of 34 versus 10%. Now, why does that matter? It's not just because there's decreased bone density. It's because when you have decreased bone density, that fall or that small trip and fall at home, off of a step, over a toy, whatever it might happen to be, um, winds up becoming something that's really a low trauma fracture. So that's that hip fracture, that risk fracture. Um, and that's a really increased significant risk in patients with chronic pancreatitis and exocrine insufficiency. Now, what happens when you actually treat those patients with pancreatic enzymes and supplement it out? Well, that actually decreases their fracture risk back to normal. And when you go one step further and say, well, let's look not only their decreased fracture risk, but let's look at their overall um, bone density scores on imaging, those actually significantly improve as well. So it's not only that it's a common disease, it's a 
significantly morbid disease, um, but also, but also it's treatable. And that's the key part here. Um, though this is not a medical complication, it is a financial complication. There's a significant um, increased risk and burden of illness um, when you have patients with exocrine insufficiency, looking at a large um, study of almost 30,000 patients. They have, there's more costs if you have exocrine insufficiency. And there's no significant differences in cost due to workplace absence, but there's more short and long-term disability. Um, and the reason why that's important um, is we start to think about if you have a patient that maybe is able to go to work but isn't as productive and we draw data out of our colleagues in the irritable bowel syndrome community that shows that workplace productivity goes down. And that's something that's really key to understand here that this is not an isolated condition. We did a study a couple of years ago now um, with the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network looking at patients that had pancreatic cancer and bear with me as I extrapolate a little bit of data into um, our purposes for today. But the key part of this was that patients didn't often talk to their providers and finally get to the point of saying, I'm taking my enzymes. So we said, okay, great. Six out of seven patients talked to their healthcare provider about pancreatic enzymes. Then that drops to about three quarters that were prescribed enzymes, correctly prescribed about two thirds, and when you get down to who actually were prescribed the correct dose of enzymes and took those enzymes appropriately, less than a third. So there's a lot of education that we can do and a lot of areas for improvement. The other part about why that's important is that patients felt better when they took their enzymes. They had more weight gain, less weight loss. And that's an opportunity for us to not only improve quality of life, but also reduce comorbidities. Dr. Forsmark and colleagues did a study actually a few years ago now looking at chronic pancreatitis and pancreatic cancer patients. And this is from baseline minimum dosing recommendations for total dose in a day. It doesn't ensure compliance, but simply did a patient actually fill a prescription? And if they did, were they prescribed the appropriate dose? So when we look here, the numbers are staggeringly low of, of filled a prescription and prescribed an appropriate dose in either chronic pancreatitis or pancreatic cancer, eight and a half and five and a half percent respectively. So a lot of work that can be done and a lot of opportunities for improvement. We looked also at factors, for example, in pancreatic cancer that may influence treatment for exocrine insufficiency. And this was from the Explorus database out of Cleveland. We noted that there were about 64 million patients in the database of which about 58,000 had pancreatic cancer. And Pancreatic enzyme were only prescribed in about nine and a half percent of those patients, so really low. Couple of factors that were associated with under treatment, um, and that was really older age and African American race and ethnicity. So these are areas where we can start to target those populations to improve our overall treatment strategies. Similarly designed study in patients with chronic pancreatitis, about ninety-seven thousand patients with chronic pancreatitis of which the treatment rate was about 14%, so a little bit better, um, but still, again, significantly low. And there's treatment disparities affecting African-American and Hispanic patients, so areas, again, that we can improve our overall treatment of this condition in subpopulations. We partnered with the NPF now several years ago, but kind of a cool study on the importance of really working together as teams and the importance of National Pancreas Foundation Centers of Excellence. And this is when there was a much smaller network of NPF centers showing that there was increased treatment of pancreatic and with pancreatic enzymes for exocrine insufficiency and chronic pancreatitis in NPF centers compared to surrounding areas and remote areas. And with the NPF's commitment to education over the years and commitment to patient care, that opportunity for NPF certified centers of excellence across the country has really increased. And I would suspect that if we did this study again today, we'd probably see even better data performance over time, really scoring or underscoring the importance and focus on teams that work together and have this expertise in order to better our patient care. One last part that I'll leave you with on the exocrine side before we switch to the diabetic side is just a quick study underscoring the importance of 
nutritional status in patients with pancreatic cancer. And we know that sometimes our treatment options in pancreatic cancer are limited. And really, if we look here in the graph on the bottom right and highlighted in the red box, we see that patients that had nutritional status improvements and were treated with for their exocrine insufficiency had improved both median overall survival and one year survival. So underscores the importance, the importance again of nutritional status in a series of disease states with the pancreas. As we switch gears to diabetes, remember a single episode of acute pancreatitis can lead to exocrine insufficiency and it can also lead to endocrine insufficiency. In patients that have more severe acute pancreatitis, if they had necrosis or so loss of tissue of the gland, or if potentially there was alcohol as the etiology of that pancreatitis episode that argues that there may be a little bit more damaged. And this is really a progressive phenomenon over time as we get further away. And that pooled use of insulin increases over time after that episode of acute pancreatitis. In chronic pancreatitis, the prevalence is about 30 to 40% increasing, and this is an overall prevalence, and this increases over time. So three years post-diagnosis, about 15%. And when you get to, for example, 20 years post-diagnosis, 46 to 83% have uh, diabetes and then so on and so forth from there. There are some risk factors that we think about in terms of, for example, obesity, that would be a traditional patient for diabetes such as type 2, but really later onset of chronic pancreatitis, the presence of exocrine insufficiency, more calcified scarred gland and longer duration of chronic pancreatitis lead us to these conclusions. Now, just a key part here, if you have a patient with pancreatic, excuse me, with chronic pancreatitis that now has new onset diabetes and weight loss, remember we do need to think about complications such as pancreatic cancer, though thankfully not exceedingly common, but it's a little bit harder to treat this condition than, for example, traditional type 2 diabetes because it's not just insulin production loss or insulin resistance, but also that we lose the cells that counter-regulate to help us regulate against low blood sugar or hypoglycemia. And so patients with diabetes and chronic pancreatitis are often more prone to brittle diabetes and hypoglycemic episodes, and there's not really an ideal perfect medication regimen for this though something like a total pancreatectomy with islet cell transplantation where we're able to try to help mitigate some of that or potentially insulin pumps may be a little bit better to try to regulate in real time. Lastly, there's a couple of, of ongoing recent studies and ongoing studies um, looking at the long-term effects of diabetes and chronic pancreatitis. The COSMO study, for example, showed that diabetes and chronic pancreatitis increases risk of hospitalization from chronic pulmonary disease, infectious diseases, renal disease, and actually increases the overall risk of death in these patients. And then, and then um, we have to also remember that if you have a patient with chronic pancreatitis and diabetes, there is to at least some degree compared to the general population an overall increased risk of cancer of the pancreas. And these are really compounding risks in these populations. So we do have to keep this in mind and do need to screen regularly. And there's an ongoing study to evaluate chronic pancreatitis and complications, including diabetes. With that, I'll leave you with a couple of take home points, which is that there's substantial impact on symptoms, quality of life, morbidity and mortality in patients with exocrine insufficiency and chronic pancreatitis. And treatment of that oftentimes will mitigate this risk to at least some extent depending on the type of complication. And then remember that diabetes is common in pancreatic disease, is a little bit different than the traditional type two diabetic and has some specifically unique risks. With that, I'd like to say thank you for joining me today. Thank you to the NPF and my co-panelists for the opportunity, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks so much. Thanks, Jody and Luis, if you could come back on, great. So there are several questions that have come up and maybe I can go through them. Uh, one of the questions uh, came up and there's uh, more than one on this sort of topic. And that is that um, uh, because of costs, sometimes patients are considering over-the-counter products, a variety that are available out there of various 
uh, types. Uh, she mentioned one, but there are obviously uh, dozens of these that are available depending on where you look. And so the question is, are these as effective as the prescription uh, type? And Luis, that's, I wonder if you want to take a shot at that. Absolutely. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for that question. I get it all the time also because as I mentioned, enzymes are quite expensive. Unfortunately, um, uh, we, we cannot vouch for the, uh, effectiveness, the effectiveness and because of the dosing. For example, the one that's, that's on, on the site, the lipo gold, is based on the, uh, the French units. And so how do you, what's the equivalent to USB units, you know, the US pharmacopoeia units? So it's difficult to know. Uh, they, were not, they were not tested um, in, in any study uh, and uh, and they tend to be really low doses. Uh, again, uh, our, as as mentioned a while ago, our paper produces way much more enzymes than are necessary. But uh, the studies did kind of give us some of it an indication of how many lipase units to, you need to improve statarrhea, fatten the stool, and the uh, and the fecal consistency. And and uh, that is you know several tens of thousand units higher than what these over the counter enzymes recommend in their uh, in their package insert. So if you're taking those, you're likely underdosing, and I wouldn't even know to tell you if you double the dose, you're going to reach the appropriate clinical dose that would be uh, that would be helpful for you. So that's the problem with these enzymes. A lot of them are actually um, uh, plant based. Some of them are plant based, or also some that are pork based. By the way, I was surprised that a patient showed me that it was pork based. But anyhow, that is the problem with those. So. Um, and, and I'll tell you something, I've had some patients who've done that and say, wow, it, it helped me. Well, so be it. But generally speaking, you, there is no non-prescription equivalent. Jody, there were also some questions which were uh, related to this, and that is, um, uh, is there a way to help navigate the cost? Are there some strategies that you relate to your patients, patient assistant programs, that kind of stuff in terms of uh, getting some help? Absolutely. So I think there's there's two parts to this, and um, it's really challenging. These are are very expensive medications, and it's not just you know um, a pill a day or a pill a month, but we're talking about multiple capsules potentially every day, maybe eight or more in some situations. Um, there's a couple of things. Uh, there's patient assistance programs from uh, the major manufacturers that require um, to physician or uh, physician provider. Um, to be part of that process to help them and a patient component as part of uh, both initiating the assistance program and then some of the demographics data that's required, et cetera. But they're really good and really helpful um, and have been very successful in some of my patients, um, especially uh, with uh, at least two major manufacturers. I think it's a little bit challenging sometimes in the patients on Medicare. Um, and that often is um, a bit of an issue because there's some degree of limits with Medicare prescription drug programs. Um, and so we have to get a little bit creative at times, but thankfully um, it's though significantly costly, there's a series of mechanisms in place to overall help patients. Um, and I think that's also the benefit of, of working with, for example, a pancreatic center that may have additional resources available. Thanks. There were some questions in terms of how to take them or what's the proper way to take them. And um, particularly some comments that sometimes are kind of big pills to swallow. So how to navigate the number of pills, the size of the pills and the meal. And so I wondered, Louise, how would you, what do you tell your patients in terms of how to take them? Uh, that, that's a fantastic question. So a couple of tricks. One of them is to maximize mixing you know, first of all, it should be with meals. A lot of these so-called uh, failures are because they take them in the morning, the rest of their meds, and don't need to until two hours later. The enzymes are gone. So take them and and, and to uh, augment uh, the mixing, you know, it has to be with a meal. You take two and then you eat, or you take one at the beginning, one at the end of the meal. If you're taking more than two, I will tell them to break them down throughout the meal as uncomfortable as it is to eat and take a pill, but that will maximize the mixing. So that's one. The other thing is, yes, you can open the capsules, and you can put it in a semi-acidic environment, like let's say yogurt, and that way it won't activate the enzymes. And that way you can take them that way or even through a feeding tube uh, and they won't become activated until they're in the appropriate pH. So uh, that's another way to do so. And yes, you're absolutely right. Um, the non-enteric coated bio case can actually be sprinkled on the food. I've never tasted to see if it changes the, the, uh, the food consistency, but uh, yes, you can actually do that. And I know some patients just go ahead and sprinkle it on the food. So there are different ways of doing that, but keep in mind 
all these things do affect the um, potentially affect the bioavailability of the medication. Jody, there was a question about uh, supplements, vitamin supplements, fat soluble vitamin supplements. What do you tell your patients about those? So everybody's a little bit different, I think, on this. Um, at certain times, especially if there's uh, symptoms of micronutrient deficiencies, we may do a broader panel. At the very least, I think it's reasonable to check for fat soluble vitamin deficiencies on an annual basis. Um, that's at least what I do in my patients, uh, screening vitamin A, D, E, usually an INR based on vitamin K challenges. Um, and I also check for diabetes at the same time. Um, in those, though, there's no guidelines to support that. Um, I think it's generally reasonable practice uh, with a set of annual labs. Um, but this is the other part of it. Um, two things. The first is very, very reasonable to take a multivitamin every day. Um, if you're going to be taking um, pancreatic enzymes, I think that's that generally covers a series of the at least smaller micronutrients. And this is a kind of well-balanced one, not a, hey, I only took, you know, my kids Fred Flintstone vitamins today, um, but a generally uh, balanced adult multivitamin. And then, you know, the other part of this is um, you can always think about monitoring long term a little bit differently. Um, but I think at least taking a multivitamin, not unreasonable. Um, Darwin Conwell presents a series of data over the years um, looking at pain in chronic pancreatitis, specifically in the value of antioxidants, and uh, had something relatively striking. I think this is apt for our population, though not necessarily about exocrine insufficiency alone, but about pain in chronic pancreatitis and nutrients with that. And the antioxidant cocktail that he had come up with um, is about nine different um, supplements and vitamins with it, or about a scoop of blueberries. Um, and so uh, I happen to um, I happen to really like blueberries myself, and I generally recommend them to my patients, uh, especially if they have um, some degree of uh, oxidative stress, such as chronic pancreatitis. I don't think it's unreasonable, provided that uh, it doesn't throw diabetes out of whack. Gotcha. And Louise, uh, uh, Jody made the point that um, uh, that patients should expect that their doctors may be are measuring these fat soluble vitamins if they have presumed exocrine pancreatic insufficiency on a yearly basis and checking for diabetes which is i think very reasonable is that what you do as well in your practice yes absolutely i do that on a yearly basis there was a consensus and a recommendation i think you were part of that by the way back in 2014 i believe from the uh from the pancreas group and uh, one of the APA meetings, and I believe that was the recommendation. It was a, it was really just a suggestion, let's say that, or a recommendation, not necessarily a guideline. So I do that, but I also incorporate others, you know, magnesium, zinc, uh, INR, as Jody already mentioned, I think that's kind of, that's uh, highly important because it's amazing how frequently, and, and you know this, you know, the percentage 10 to 30% of patients have some degree of micronutrient deficiency and the downward spiral that can occur from being uh, deficient for years. So I do check it on a daily basis. Gotcha, thank you. There's a, a, a couple uh, or maybe questions about diagnosis um, of EPI. Uh, one was about fat studies, uh, stool fat studies. And the question was, you know, a 72 hour versus a spot fecal fat for, uh, you know, for fat staining. So the just obtaining a random stool and staining it for fat is relatively unreliable. It sort of depends on how high a fat diet the patient was on, you know, the day before as to what's going to be in the stool. Um, so it's, it's, it's like a lot of these things in diagnosis, it's you're putting together a bunch of clues. You don't have a single test that proves it one way or another, but you're trying to, you know, look at all the various clues and make your best judgment that they do have it or don't have it. And there's a, there's a decision that comes after that. Obviously, if you think they do have it, then you're probably going to treat them. And if you think they don't have it, then you're probably not going to, but we, we all wish we had a simple way to do that. There was another question about this, um, this EPI decision tool, you know, is it reliable? Is it good? It's, it's, um, I think it's helpful, but it's, it's sort of one of these pieces of evidence that you incorporate into everything else. It tries to do that sort of quantitatively for you asking questions that I think a sensible clinician would be asking anyway. Do they have steatorrhea? Do they have atrophy? Do they have calcifications? You know, we're, we're kind of already adding that up in your mind when you decide to to treat or not treat along with the fecal elastase. This just puts away, if you don't see a lot of these folks, it 
sort of prompts you to think about the the aspects that an expert's kind of already thinking about. So it's not magic. Um, you know, it's meant to be helpful, particularly if you don't see a lot of these folks, it prompts you on the common things that Jody or Louis Sire might think about when we're seeing these folks. There was Christian, a the, interesting, the interesting part about that screening tool is also, I think it helps, especially in patients that may be at risk without having, you know, longstanding several years of chronic pancreatitis. Um, that may be a little bit earlier in the disease course, and there may be a little bit more subtle findings that don't really jump out at us. Um, and in that group, you can really make a lot of, uh, do a lot of good. Um, it's sometimes people say, you know, how do you fix a patient that's asymptomatic? The answer is there's a lot of micronutrient deficiencies, as Luis pointed out, that happen way further, uh, or excuse me, way earlier in the process. And so in that respect, making that diagnosis and starting treatment earlier may be a little bit more helpful. There was a question about the expertise of uh, folks in managing uh, EPI, and you made the point that, um, you know, the, the NPF Centers of Excellence tries to identify areas that have uh, uh, physicians who can do that. Uh, one question was, if you have somebody in your local hospital that can treat acute pancreatitis, does that mean they can, they can manage EPI as well? And I have my own opinion about that. I don't know if any of you have to... <laughs> wants to weigh in on that one. My sense would be that it's not a guarantee, that's for sure. Yeah, I, uh, I, I second that. I think everybody's level of comfort um, in both diagnosis and management of this disease process is different. Um, and for example, somebody may be perfectly comfortable treating acute pancreatitis um, secondary to uh, a gallstone that was passed in the hospital acutely, but may not really be comfortable following that patient post pancreatitis or with chronic pancreatitis and the complications of it. And that's where things like, you know, guidelines, checklists, screening tools, things like that really help that pa that practitioner that may say, hey, listen, um, I see a patient with acute pancreatitis now. My next consult is for uh, Crohn's and colitis flare. And uh, the patient after that has hepatitis. Um, and so it, it may really help start to um, take it because we know um, even if NPF centers, and granted it was a paucity of the current number um, in that original study, we know that actually most patients with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency are treated outside of NPF specialty centers. And so um, whatever we can do to kind of bring up the overall standard of care and tie it across the country, I think is helpful. But clearly uh, there is a role for improvement. Uh, you know, Jody, as you showed in some of your studies, right, how underdosed people are. Um, and uh, for a disease, you know, chronic pancreatitis affects two, three hundred thousand people in the whole, whole country. It's in a disease that a lot of people see actually regularly. So I would encourage everybody to at least get one expert opinion. You do that for other diseases and then, you know, kind of get a guideline as to where you should continue the therapy because you're absolutely correct. Most of us who treat, you know, acute pancreatitis don't necessarily treat the complications thereof and especially the uh, sometimes very um, uh, difficult diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis or chronic pancreatitis and so forth. So I would encourage, get, get push for that extra opinion. And the other thing I would encourage people is to visit the NPF website. There's a wealth of information there that can help sort of inform you um, about this aspect of pancreatic disease and others. Um, I think we've reached the end of our our time frame is that correct, Trish? Are we? Yes, I think we are good. Thank you all so much for your participation and a great attendance for by everyone. And again, to just reinforce everything, if you have additional questions, you can reach out to us on our website, and we're happy to follow up with you from there as well. But I wanted to thank our panelists, Dr. Forsmark, as well for being the moderator, and for Avi for sponsoring our education webinar. Thank you all thank for you. joining. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.